Okay, good morning. I want to welcome you all to the first geo for dev Symposium and Workshop, which is organized by the Center for Effective Global Action, SIGA, the Big Pixel Initiative at UC San Diego, and the Geospatial Innovation Facility, GIF, at UC Berkeley. Uh, you know, when we first um, brainstormed about this event, we didn't expect that it will, it will attract so many uh, people from so many universities, organizations, NGOs, um, private companies. As you might know, we had uh, more than uh, 100 people um, on a waiting list and 200 um, participants. So geo for dev is a two-day event that includes a symposium and workshops. Uh, th this event is a unique opportunity to bring together experts on data science, environmental engineers, and geoscientists, together with social scientists and economists who will present state-of-the-art tools, methods, and applications that utilize the remote sensing data to map, measure, and understand our world. The symposium today will showcase 29 scientific presentations and eight posters presented by 36 leading researchers that come from 24 organizations. All of the presenters utilize novel geospatial analytics to address the world's environmental and societal challenges. We divided the symposium today into three um, main themes or um, sessions. The first one is climate, agriculture, and the environment, which features um, um, studies that utilize satellite data to monitor agriculture productivity, accessibility to water and green spaces, and to monitor air quality. The second um, theme is uh, measuring urbanization and human settlements, which features um, studies that use remote sensing techniques to detect and map human settlements and populations, primarily in developing countries. And the third one is um, economic growth and development, featuring studies that use satellite data to assess economic development and economic activity in developing countries. In addition, um, at 1.30 today, we will have um, a lightning talk session, which will uh, be moderated by um, Brian Min, um, in which you will hear um, um, 10 excellent um, case studies from researchers that apply remote sensing and geospatial analysis to gain insights about developing countries um, that will eventually help um, to promote sustainable development. Also at 4.30 today, we will have three parallel panel sessions covering these themes, and we hope that um, they will encourage uh, fruitful discussions and um, eventually collaborations. So we received uh, more than uh, 50 um, high quality abstract submissions and the um, selection of the papers and posters was extremely difficult. I want to take this opportunity to thank the um, symposium chairs who spent many days uh, reviewing and evaluating all the submissions. Marshall Burke, Jen Burney, Gordon Hansen, Salomon Chiang, Amit Kanderwal, Craig McIntosh, and Nancy Thomas. I also want to remind you that we invite the uh, presenters to submit their papers to a special issue in the journal um, Development Engineering, the Journal of Engineering in, Econom in Economic Development, uh, which will focus on geospatial analysis for international development. Um, if you are interested um, in submitting a paper, uh, please send, um, please email your draft uh, manuscript to Kevin McCarthy, and you have the, um, his email um, also on the website. Before um, midnight, September 11, uh, the drafts will be reviewed by the, the journal's editors-in-chief for fit with the journal scope, um, and we plan to notify the um, authors if their papers are invited to be submitted to the special section peer review process by September 22nd. Thank you to, to um, Asho Gajil and Paul Gertler, the um, editors-in-chief of the um, journal for establishing the geospatial special section and for recognizing this as an important um, avenue of inquiry. Now, uh, tomorrow, the um, second day, uh, will feature um, 10 workshops um, that will provide an introduction to different tools, data, and platforms for geospatial um, analytics. The workshops will be presented by academics and tech sector partners, including um, Air Data, GIF, Google Earth Engine, Mapillary, Digital Globe, Harris, Mapbox, Planet, Siga, and Ush Ushahidi. Um, Last page, uh, before we start, um, a few more thanks. Um, special thanks to the conference organizers, um, Nancy Thomas from GIF, and Natasha Bell, Kevin McCarthy, David Gonzalez, and das Dustin Marshall from SIGA for the excellent job they did in organizing um, this event. And they did most of the job. 
Uh, we also want to thank the uh, Blam Center for hosting, um, especially Taryn Haynes, the um, events coordinator, and Marianne McCormick, the um, exec executive director, for letting us um, use their space. And also note that the Blam Center partners with um, SIGA on the USAID funded Development Impact Lab, which launched the um, Development Engineering Journal. And a big thank you to our um, sponsors, um, Facebook, Mapbox, and Berkeley's um, Social Science Matrix for um, helping us make this event um, happen. And of course, um, most important, thank you all for coming um, um, to this event. I hope to see many of you also tomorrow at the um, workshop, um, workshop sessions. Um, and we do hope that um, these um, two days will be uh, fruitful and an opportunity to learn from others, to network, and again, um, to um, um, have um, a new collaborations. So with that, I want to invite um, the um, keynote speaker, um, Joe Mascaro. Uh, Joe is a tropical ecologist and director of academic programs at Planet, a San Francisco-based company that operates the largest fleet of Earth imaging satellites. Uh, Joe works with um, universities and individual investigators uh, to utilize Planet's imaging resources to enhance primary research and education, improve forest monitoring and so conservation, expand food security, and promote ecological resilience for some of the world's most vulnerable communities. I'd like to thank the organizers, especially Natasha, and particularly call out the attention that I feel this workshop has placed on the real hands-on exercises, especially tomorrow, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk to you today about what I call the global sensing inversion. And on the chance that I forget to specify what it is that I mean by that, I'll go ahead and say it now, which is that I think we're increasingly in a time where the volume of remote sensing data on the ecosystems and peoples that we all study is outstripping the amount of time we can put on the ground um, by a dramatic uh, amount. And I want to talk to you about a little bit about how we got there and what I think we should do in this, in this new period to leverage these data sources. I want to start here. This is um, <coughs> a satellite that was once called the Earth Resources Technology Satellite 1, later renamed Landsat. Um, it was launched in 1972. 1972 is an interesting time period for uh, Earth and environment conservation. This is around the time that we, uh, in the United States, signed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, um, created the EPA, had the first Earth Day around the same time period. Um, and uh, this was the first satellite that was specifically designed to look at the ecosystems on the Earth's surface that we all depend upon. Um, and since it's launched, uh, an enormous amount uh, of hardware has gone into orbit. Um, here's a few examples. Uh, I wanted to note, actually, these pieces were, these are pieces of art done by our art director, Forrest Stearns. A um, couple of satellites of, of key interest. Uh, Iconos, launched in 1999, was really the first commercial remote sensing satellite that got down to one meter per pixel that allowed us to see an enormous level of detail on the Earth, um, at least uh, in the commercial space, um, that we hadn't seen before. Um, since that time, we've seen also the launch of the Sentinel program. Here I've got Sentinel-2A, which was launched in 2015. Its companion satellite launched not long after that enables five-day revisit at 10 meters per pixel on the Earth's surface, um, a huge step change when it comes to free sources of data that anyone in the world can access. And also on the commercial side, we've seen an improvement in spatial resolution, including launching of uh, exquisite telescopes um, by Digital Globe, most recently Worldview 4, um, as well as the Skysat constellation, uh, which recently became part of Planet uh, this year. This is kind of what things look like in aggregate. This is a, a, a smoothed look at the growth in Earth observation sensors over the same time period. And I highlighted three trends here. So the first, the blue bars, again, these are three-year running averages, even including the columns, shows you the average number of Earth observation satellites launched on a given year. Um, you can see an explosion in recent launches of Earth observation satellites. There's also two other trends of note. Uh, the average spatial resolution for those sensors that carry a multispectral camera has declined dramatically. It's now on average below five meters per pixel for, for vehicles going to orbit. And the, the mass of those spacecraft in the red line has also declined. Um, and that's important because it means it's easier for us to get assets into space at the same cost per pound. Um, this is 
not even getting into the fact that rocket launch costs are also decreasing dramatically. And so um, there's a huge number of assets uh, in space now, and it gives us opportunities to do ridiculous things like this. This is a photo of Worldview 4 launching, taken by its companion Worldview 2 satellite. Um, pretty stunning. And just a couple of months ago, Planet uh, captured this. Uh, this is actually not a video, it's an animation. It's the same frame rate we normally image. And what you'll see here as we slow it down is the launch of a Soyuz rocket from Baikonur Cosmodrome carrying 48 satellites. This is imagery captured by a satellite one of our Dove satellites that is about the size of a big toaster. Um, and our team basically uh, conducted this off nadir pointing orbital maneuver in order to capture this launch from space. On the development side of things, we've also seen some transformational uh, occurrences. One great one over the past couple of years is the identification of an illegal phishing operation that was a collaboration between AP and Digital Globe that led to the freeing of thousands of slaves that have been held captive on fishing vessels. Um, this is an image taken by Worldview 3 that, that was the smoking gun that essentially caught these slave ships uh, unloading fish into a refrigeration vessel. We've also been able to see agriculture in greater detail. This is similar sub-meter resolution imagery over Salinas Valley, California. We can see individual rows of crops being harvested. Um, and with high cadence observations from these many Earth observation platforms, including planet's dove sensors, we can now see the temporal axis of this area of the world um, and the rest of the world, too. Uh, I chose Salinas here because it's got incredibly high turnover from uh, crops, so you often get multiple crops of vegetables on the same field per year. This is so noisy to the eye. Here's what it looks like if you just look at a single field. And you can actually see individual rows being harvested and baled. Planet's now imaging the whole land surface of the Earth approximately every day. So we're able to capture this whenever the sky is clear. Simultaneously, we've seen a revolution in machine learning and computer vision. Um, this is one from a, I, I found this on a series on YouTube called Two Minute Papers, which I strongly encourage you to register for. Um, especially if you don't want to uh, go into the guts of machine learning papers like I do. Um, these are synthetic birds created by uh, generative adversarial networks. That bottom row is the subject of this particular paper, um, which produced using only inputs of text at the top row um, and essentially daisy chained on step one of the, of the GAN output here in row one. They were able to produce these incredibly photorealistic images that, no joke, uh, well, it used to be like if you showed them to my grandmother, she would say, yeah, they totally look real. And now you show them to anyone and they look real. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so this, this massive amount of data has, I think, changed uh, a lot about uh, how we all do our work. And so um, uh, I'm going to present uh, just a couple of uh, guidelines uh, or suggestions, I think, in how to operate scientifically, especially in this increasingly data-dense environment. Here's the first one. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the data feeds are so enormous that it's, it's now easy to get lost. Uh, and this is particularly of note for graduate students in the room. Um, there are enormous possibilities, and I think it's, uh, it's worth taking a moment to, to kind of breathe deep and, and look and see where we can have the most benefit. Um, okay, here's the first real rule. Truth doesn't reside on the ground. Um, I have long been hostile towards the phrase ground truth. Um, and it, it comes from a mix of, uh, ex of my own personal experience with remote sensing and also uh, increasing awareness of some of the human biases. This is a, a favorite paper of mine by Lieberman and Trope in Science, which concerns how the human mind relates to objects that are either uh, objects you hold in your presence or objects that are away from you, that are sort of remote. Um, and so they say remote location should bring to mind the distant rather than near future, other people rather than oneself, and unlikely rather than likelier events. In other words, your brain chemistry is wired to trust those things that you can touch and hold in your hand. And in fact, you're even more likely to trust the word of another human that has held those things in his or her hand. Um, then you are necessarily a remote instrument looking at them. 
Um, if you don't read science magazine, but you do science fiction, here's another explanation. This is uh, from a favorite Star Trek scene of mine in which Commander Data, who is a robot, an android, incapable of emotion in this particular scene, and Captain Picard are looking at a historical piece of iconography. I'll spare you the details. Um, and Picard wants to, wants to touch the rocket, and he has this like amazing emotional connection with it, and Data turns to him and says, like, I don't understand, why does touching the rocket make it more real for you? It's exactly the same uh, to me whether I touch it or not. Um, and this is, to me, deeply instructive about how our brains work. Um, I'll tell you a brief story about how I came to recognize this, own, this bias that I had. Um, and it concerns mapping of tropical forest biomass, which is what I spent the majority of my postdoc doing um, with the Carnegie Airborne Observatory. What we were trying to do, to put it simply, is match remote sensing data, in this case, airborne LIDAR data. Um, this is laser ranging data, so three-dimensional models of tropical forests with field data. And at the time, we're talking about the gold standard of field observation for forests. And that is a forest inventory plot. Um, this is roughly the schematic of plot that we started with um, when I was working with Greg in Hawaii in 2009. Um, and when you look at this, especially those of you that aren't working in forests, it probably looks like kind of a Rube Goldberg device. Um, in fact, it's a device designed roughly 50 years ago to do a really good job of stratified sampling of forests. And the basic idea here is that you put in a forest inventory that's shown in a small view of those four little plots uh, at four kilometer spacing. At each one of those points, you install a center point with a center plot and three uh, ancillary plots around it. And then with e each plot, you have a nested protocol. You measure certain trees of certain sizes in certain places. You look at diversity in certain places. You look at soils in certain places. Um, what took us several years and hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> Uh, to learn is that these plots are terrible for linking field data to remote sensing data. Um, and I want to tell you why, and it's instructive not so much for this specific system, um, but for those systems that you all work in where you may have these biases, either historical due to the fact that there's ongoing field protocols that you just sort of recycle and continue to use, or certain agencies that maintain standardized field protocols that have been written 50 years ago, 60 years ago, and have not yet been updated for this volume of enormous data. So how did we figure out that these plots were terrible? We went to a different kind of plot. Um, and it was just a fluke thing. It was just the next project. We started working in a large 50 hectare plot in Panama, um, in this case on the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute site uh, called Barro, Col Barro Colorado Island, which is in the center of the Panama Canal. This is a LIDAR view from a later paper uh, of the 50 hectare plot. What's interesting about this plot is that uh, it's sort of um, the most exquisite field sampling of a forest on the planet. This plot is surveyed every two years, and it's laid out with survey grade equipment. So distances are essentially perfect on the geoid of the Earth. Every single tree bigger than your pinky finger is measured and monitored. That's an average of 250,000, 300,000 live trees every time they do the survey. It takes them about eight months to do that survey. Um, and on the LIDAR side, we can collect this one site in approximately eight seconds when you count for aircraft flight time. Um, the field data are exquisite, and they're geospatially mapped. That's what's unique about this plot. So you can do interesting community ecology studies um, where you map the distribution of these various species. I'm not going to talk about that. What concerned us in this case was the biomass, right? And this is something, when it comes to the international development space, concerns carbon emissions to the atmosphere. We were literally trying to improve, make more accurate the methods by which we track carbon stocks and emissions. Um, this bottom panel shows you the same kind of LIDAR data, in this case at five meter resolution. And just uh, sort of by accident, what we did is we converted the field data to the same spatial structure as the remote sensing data. We essentially inverted the question um, of linking these two data sets. And that top panel that looks like a starscape is what the field data look like when you thread the carbon units on a five meter scale. And so essentially what you have are these really, really bright dots where there's a five by five meter pixel that has a huge tree in it. And then around that you have this negative space of empty dots. And 
in relating those two data sets, we found that the, at, at five meter resolution, even at 20 meter resolution, the noise was spectacular trying to put these two data sets together. This top panel on the left, that huge cloud of points upper left, is basically trying to get 20 meter resolution field data to talk to 20 meter resolution LiDAR data. Um, and then we aggregated the data set in order to decompose its spatial structure, and we came up with this thing in the middle here. That's the field data too. In this case, we merely mapped the field data onto the same spatial structure of the trees. Um, and this was the aha moment that actually led us to totally understand in a completely new way the relationship between the field data that we'd been collecting and the data from space, um, in this case from the air. Um, and it led us over here in this panel to the right to understand the, the uncertainties that we were working with and realize that at one hectare resolution, we could map biomass in forests with about 10% of the accuracy, within 10% of the accuracy we could get on the ground. Um, and that led us to spit out a one hectare resolution countrywide carbon map, which was the first national map of carbon stocks, in this case for Peru. Um, I call this story to your attention not necessarily to talk about forests specifically, but to talk to any of those of you who work with relating remote sensing data sets and field data sets, and to try to think through the implicit biases that you may have in terms of either intrinsically trusting the field data um, or uh, visualizing the spatial structure of the field data and the remote sensing data differently rather than in the same kind of universe. The second thing I want to suggest is to strive to be sensor agnostic. Um, because we have so many assets going into space, we've got drones, what that means is the tools that you're building, uh, if they're constructed in such a way where they're married to a particular suite of uh, spectral bands, for example, then it becomes difficult to jump to a new sensor. Um, but in fact, we have so many data feeds coming that the ability to, to sort of toggle from sensor to sensor becomes critical. Um, here I want to present some work that was done uh, by Rasmus Hoberg and Matt McCabe out of King Abdul University in Saudi Arabia. And they were dealing with this challenge in a relatively simplistic way, um, but what they, what they spat out the other side was really powerful. Um, in this case, what they were trying to do is produce planet resolution, so 3.7 meter resolution feeds, information feeds related to things like NDVI for the crops that they are studying, but also more exotic information feeds, things like leaf area index, which tell you something about the biomass in the field, um, and also crop water use, which is in this case is a flux of actual uh, water going from the ecosystem into the crops themselves. So they started with uh, what a lot of people are working with, which is a kind of sensor specific information feed. So in this case, if you're working with Landsat data, you can spit out an NDVI feed relatively trivially. You basically are doing band math on the near infrared and the red data, and you get this information feed of NDVI. That feed's going to be stable because there's only one Landsat sensor in space. So everything that's coming down is taken by the same instrument, and uh, you can go into the Landsat calibration uh, kind of history to understand why that stability exists. Um, but it exists. It makes it difficult, though, to align with other sensors that perform differently under different situations. Here's imagery, uh, in this case, NDVI from multiple sensors on roughly the same day. The planet NDVI is shown on the left. Then there's an atmospheric corrected version of the planet imagery in the second column to the right. Then Sentinel and Landsat. Um, what this highlights is that the actual spectral architecture of these sensors differs planet's red channel is not the same as Sentinel's, is not the same as Landsat's. And that's not going to be the same as a drone camera, a digital off-the-shelf camera that you put onto a, a drone. Um, here's kind of what this looks like. I won't go into the details, but you guys have mostly seen the spectral architecture of the Landsat and, and uh, Sentinel sensors. Here's a side-by-side -side between Landsat and the Dove sensor specifically. What I'm talking about is the literal channel architecture in the, in the radiometry. So here you can see that the dotted line Landsat sensor in the red and black, so sorry, the red and near-infrared, so the red and black on this graph, um, is different than the planet sensor. Photons in a particular wavelength may end up in the planet red channel, but not the Landsat red channel. What Rasmus and Matt did that was so powerful, um, and many other users are moving along the same lines, including I'm pretty sure a few people in this room, is to produce a model that stabilized these outputs. 
um, such that they were all intercalibrated. They did this using a huge number of tandem observations, that is, captures from space from both the planet sensor, also the sentinel sensor, and the Landsat sensor. Um, because uh, these channels are conserved within a particular sensor, these relationships from sensor to sensor are very strong. This is the, what the model performance looks like once they were done. It's pretty spectacular. So they're able now with this model to seamlessly jump from Landsat to planet or planet to sentinel. Um, what this introduces, this, this methodological approach introduces something even more novel, which is to interrelate multiple sensors, some of which have certain spectral bands that others lack, right? So for instance, uh, Landsat's got a sphere band, planet sensor does not. Um, Matt and Rasmus were able to generate a model that intercorrelated those multiple spectral signals from Landsat and planet to spit out something even more exotic, in this case, a leaf area index feed. Uh, a classic leaf area index indicator from Landsat includes the SWEAR channel. Um, so what they did is put these things together. They basically used the same modeling approach. They took tandem observations of Landsat and planet, and then they were able to produce a stable information feed that could still estimate leaf area index even when you only had planet data, that is, even in the absence of Landsat's SWEAR channel, because you've essentially used the model to understand for this region how the SWEAR variation may be indicated in other spectral bands, if that makes sense. This allows you now to do really exotic stuff, like high resolution leaf area index tracking. Um, and in this case, high temporal resolution, because you've got the planet data there. So you're talking about only a few days between images. They did an even more elaborate version of this in which they ingested ground data as well, in this case from eddy covariance. Um, for those of you that haven't worked with eddy covariance, this is a field sensor that uses a combination of an infrared gas analyzer and a sonic anemometer. This is the science-y package of it, but there are other sensors like this that are starting to enter the commercial marketplace and the device marketplace. Um, one that's similar that you guys might be aware of is built by a company, a startup called Arable. Um, it's not a sonic anemometer, but it does do high resolution local uh, chlorophyll or photosynthesis observations from a field. <coughs> In this case, this sensor was used to track water vapor. It can do that. It's taking a, a, a super timely uh, infrared gas analyzer kind of sniff to detect the water vapor volume. And then it uses the anemometer to detect the direction of flow uh, of that water vapor. And they crunch all these data sets together, again, using tandem observations. And they begin to build a stable model where even with only four channels of multispectral data from planet sensors, they can predict what the evapotranspiration dynamics are like on the fields of interest because they've intercorrelated it through this modeling approach. That allows them to produce something really unique. This is a, a, a crop water use estimate. This is a, you know, an estimate of the actual flux of the vegetation pulling water out of the soil. <coughs> the last, uh, well, second to last, but the, the last one is quite short. Um, so the third, the third case here uh, deals with scale. Um, this is something we've been thinking a lot about at Planet. Um, we have now data essentially coming out of our ears, but unless this data is interpretable and ingested into um, actionable information or converted into actionable information, then its ability to impact life on Earth is, is muted, right? Um, we think of this, and uh, Andrew Zoli, uh, who's the uh, head of Impact at Planet, came up with this framework, um, which he calls the, the four eyes. And so in, this is a way of compartmentalizing how these different data feeds and information feeds can stack up and begin to interact with things like complex systems and the global economy. So you start with a base layer of information. This is the data, right? So this would be the planet RGB plus near infrared data coming down from space, or the drone data that you captured over a set of hatchlings um, on an oceanic island that you're looking at. <coughs> Above that is an insight layer, and our friends at Orbital Insight uh, have, have taken the mantle of this particular layer, 
what does that information actually teach you? So if you're looking at oil drums and trying to understand the volume of oil in those drums, um, you, need an, you need an insight that actually is some kind of actionable piece of information. I would characterize this as the, the translation that was accomplished by Digital Globe when they tracked Silver Sea 2, right? They had a tip from AP. So suddenly, rather than just blasting the whole Pacific Ocean with Worldview 3, they were able to isolate a couple of target areas, find this ship, then send that off to get annotated through forensic analysis so that that ship could be specifically identified. I think that's the insight layer. The next one is, I think of this like a, a meta raster layer for the globe. This is the indicator layer, um, and I'll show a good example of this um, momentarily. But basically, this is, uh, in its simplest form, it might be, say, a constantly updated NDVI feed for the planet. Um, it's a, some kind of value-added content that, that predicts um, some, or characterizes a, a value-added piece of information that you, um, that you want to act on. Above that, and I don't know if we've really uh, have any examples of accomplishing this yet, but I think we're close. Um, the instrument layer here, we're talking about okay, what are the what are the world economic mechanisms, the financial mechanisms, the uh, the commerce mechanisms that actually take those indicators or insights and make change happen, right? Um, Imagine, uh, take, take a moment to think about, for example, all the divesting out of uh, fossil fuels that's taking place around the globe. There's increased interest um, in using things like carbon offset programs, uh, deforestation offset programs. And in order to use those programs, you need a geospatial data set that actually can transact with the global economy. That means it has to be updated quickly, it has to be accurate, it has to be rigorously verified, um, and it has to tell you something useful um, that, that can interact with those instruments. So let me give you an example of that. Um, this is some deforestation that we've been observing in Bolivia. This is all from the last uh, calendar year. In fact, most of this happened in the the prior six months of the, of the last 12. This is a, a new sugarcane facility that just opened, and so there's an increasing demand to power this facility with sugarcane. Um, simply looking at this deforestation, aside from maybe uh, from the point of view of some journalists or some people that live in this particular area in Bolivia or some of the sugarcane companies, this information by itself, the way I'm showing it to you, is not particularly useful. What would be extremely useful and be something that actually could transact with the global economy is monitoring the change in this ecosystem in units of carbon directly. So imagine, for example, that rather than seeing a raster layer of the forest here, you actually were looking at a raster layer that showed you in tons of carbon how much is going physically from the ecosystem and into the atmosphere. Um, this type of indicator could intersect with the global economy in a way that actually allows you to marry um, economic development with patterns on the ground. Um, this is, by the way, uh, just an example. Uh, in this case, we're using an average uh, carbon stock for this area of Bolivia. But um, suffice it to say, connecting these data sets together could be extraordinarily powerful. The very last one, uh, and just a couple of slides, I, I've been struck in my time at Planet and my time interacting with a lot of you that uh, we really cannot foresee what this huge increase in remote sensing data and geospatial data could lead to. Um, every few months we see something at Planet that we, that we truly didn't expect, and not, not at any time did we consider the possibility that we might, we might image something like this. Um, the uh, Swiss landslide that occurred a couple of weeks ago uh, was a kind of two-stage event. There was a mudslide uh, that killed eight people. Just prior to that, a few days before, there was a rockfall. And this is an image of that rockfall in progress. Uh, this is a totally fluke thing. Um, but we were able to verify that this is actually the dust cloud from the rockfall. What we did is we parsed uh, the visible channel from our spacecraft from the near infrared channel, they're captured about a half second apart. Um, and so here is the red channel, but this is the near infrared channel. So you can actually see as I toggle between these that cloud moving. These images were probably captured mere minutes after the initiation of that particular rockfall. Now, does that, uh, you know, what does this, what does this uh, foreshadow? I think, again, anything is possible. The number, as we put more and more sensors, not only in orbit, in the air, around the world, we're likely to 
uh, come to new realizations about what we can do with the data. So I'll leave it there and take questions if there's time or we're doing that later. <laughs> Thanks.